We are a lonely bunch. Homo sapiens are the last species left in a family tree that has spanned millions of years. This little collab aims to cover some of those branches, from our origins as apes through to the Australopithecines down into Homo. In the course of the past few million years, there have been a few twists and turns that didn't survive to the present day. One of those dead ends were our distant cousins Paranthropus. Who were they? How are they related to us? What did they eat? Did they make tools and give you herpes? These are the questions I'm going to be taking a look at today. So there are three species within the Paranthropus family that we know of so far, Aethiopicus, Boise, and Robustus. All of them lived between roughly 2.5 and 1 million years ago, Aethiopicus and Boise in Eastern Africa, and Robustus in Southern Africa. Their defining feature, what really makes them stand out, is their robustness, clues in the name. In particular, they had very round faces, huge cheekbones, large jaws, very large molars, and thick enamel on their teeth. But what really stands out to us the most at first glance is probably this large piece of bone called a sagittal crest that runs the length of their head. This was to help attach their large chewing muscles to their skull. They really would have had huge, round, muscular moon faces. It's a feature that also has evolved independently in gorillas and orangutans. These guys and girls were not ancestors of gorillas though, they were upright walking hominins just like us. The rest of their body shares many similarities with the Australopithecines. You may find them referred to as robust Australopithecines rather than Paranthropus. Some anthropologists don't think they are different enough to be a distinct genus of their own. We have lots of bits of these hominins, a skull here, a leg bone there, but there are very, very few fossils that have both the head and lower body preserved. For Paranthropus boise, we only have one single specimen with cranial and postcranial body parts, and even that is only identified by teeth, no facial bones. We're really waiting on the Paranthropus version of Lucy to be discovered to learn more. From the specimens of Paranthropus we do have though, we can estimate that they had a cranial capacity of 475 to 545 cc, little bit bigger than a chimpanzee, was around 156 centimeters tall, weighed around 40 to 50 kilograms, had very powerful forearms, larger than you would expect for an animal of that height, and was just generally very powerfully built. Anthropologists believe that Paranthropus exhibited a large degree of sexual dimorphism, which means the men and women were different sizes. Such exaggerated sexual dimorphism is usually found in species where males compete for female attention. Stable isotope analysis, which can be used to assess the geographical range and diet of ancient animals, suggests that smaller and therefore probably female robustus hominins moved between geographical locations more than males. This is similar to how chimpanzee and bonobo societies operate today. How exactly the Paranthropus family of hominins relates to us is difficult to say. In many ways, the more we have discovered about our evolutionary tree, the more complicated it's become. Just look at the recent finds around Neanderthals, Denisovans, maybe even a new species Luzonensis. From current evidence though, it seems that around 2.5 million years ago there was a divide in hominin evolution. Some Australopiths possibly went on to become Homo habilis and eventually Homo erectus, growing their brains, eating a higher calorie diet, and producing ever more sophisticated stone tools. This branch would of course eventually lead to us. The other half went on to become the Paranthropines, evolving into thicker hominins, larger faces. There are still plenty of unanswered questions though. Who was our last mutual ancestor? What caused this split? Are the East African Paranthropines really two distinct species? Does Robusta share a common ancestor with Boise, or are there similarities an example of convergent evolution? More finds will hopefully answer some of these questions and we'll get to learn a little more about our very distant cousins. So what did they eat? Why did they evolve such huge jaws and teeth? Before I answer this question, it's worth talking about how anthropologists even know what an animal born over one million years ago ate. 
probably the most powerful tool in the anthropologist's toolkit is stable isotope analysis, which I mentioned earlier. Here to help me explain what that is, because I'm terrible at science, is Victoria van der Haas of the University of Alberta. What are isotopes? Isotopes are atoms of a particular chemical element with the same atomic number. This means that isotopes all contain an equal number of protons, but differ in their number of neutrons. For example, the element carbon has three isotopes. C12, which is the most common naturally occurring isotope, with six protons and six neutrons. C13, which is less common and has an extra neutron, so giving it six protons and seven neutrons. And finally, C14, which has six protons and eight neutrons. The neutrons are what cause a difference in mass between these three isotopes. So even though their chemical properties are the same, this difference in mass will affect their response time during chemical or biological processes. A heavier isotope is going to respond a little slower than a lighter isotope. Isotopes can be further divided into being stable or unstable. A stable isotope will remain unchanged indefinitely, and an unstable isotope decays over time as a result of an unstable nucleus. In archaeology, Unstable isotopes aid in the dating of archaeological materials, such as C14, which is used for radiocarbon dating. The two main stable isotopes that are used in archaeology to reconstruct past diets are carbon and nitrogen. For the purpose of this video, we will only focus on the first one. How can we use them to reconstruct ancient diets? Carbon isotopes occur naturally in biological materials, such as flora and fauna, and vary between environments. During an organism's lifetime, stable isotopes are incorporated from the environment into their system through diet. When plants are consumed, carbon atoms from plant protein are routed to collagen, which is the main structural protein found in animal and human tissue, such as bone and teeth. By examining the carbon-12 to carbon-13 isotopic ratio, it is possible to determine whether animals or humans were predominantly consuming C3 or C4 plants. In terrestrial plants, there are two dominant photosynthetic pathways, known as C3 and C4. The C3 plant is typically found in temperate environments. Examples are trees, temperate grasses, and shrubs. C4 plants, such as subtropical grasses, maize, or corn, are found in hotter and more arid environments, which require plants to minimize their loss of water. As a result of their environment, the stable carbon isotope responds differently. The C3 plant strongly discriminates against the heavier isotope, C13, during CO2 fixation, resulting in low carbon-13 values. As neither of the values between the two plants overlap, it allows for the identification on the consumption of certain terrestrial foods. The carbon isotope ratio can not only be used to distinguish between terrestrial food sources, but also between marine and freshwater sources, making it a wildly applicable isotope for reconstructing ancient diets. It used to be believed that Paranthropus hominins evolved huge jaws because their diet was made up of nuts and hard, tough foods. They were even called Nutcracker Man. Stable isotope analysis does not really support that hypothesis, though. So, what did these guys eat? Well, there seems to be a divide between Robustus in South Africa and Boise in East Africa. Based on the stable isotope results from 22 individual specimens, Boise had a diet that was on average 77% C4 resources. This means that their primary nutritional source was probably grasses. This is unlike any other hominin past or present, and the results are statistically indistinguishable from animals such as equids. They're basically upright walking human cows. How incredible is that? That always blows my mind thinking about that. Did they evolve these huge jaws and muscles because they just spent all day chewing on grass? Certainly a possibility. If so, why such a stark divide in hominin evolution? our branch focusing on an increasingly calorie-rich diet, and the other on resources that are really low in calories. I mean, 77% of your diet coming from grasses is absolutely huge. To complicate matters further, stable isotope results from Robustus in South Africa show a much more varied diet. Results show that their diet was split between C4 and C3 resources. 
They still consumed way more grasses than other hominins, and certainly us, but they complemented it presumably with significant amounts of fruit. We can tell from the results that their diet varied seasonally and annually. Did they regularly migrate between forests and savanna? Did they perhaps fall back on low calorie grasses when times were tough? Why such variation in diet between Boise and Robustus? Again, did they even share a recent common ancestor or evolve independently? We can't really talk about hominins and not mention tools. It's the defining feature of our family tree, really. When and which hominins started making and using stone tools is one of the biggest debates in anthropology. The older Wan tools are the earliest unambiguous stone tools we have so far, and were used between 2.5 and 1.8 million years ago. Lots of different hominins could have produced them. Australopithecines, Homo, and Paranthropines. It's possible that they all may have used them to different degrees, though it's fair to say, of course, Homo would become the biggest tool user. There's no direct evidence that Paranthropus boise made stone tools, however, there's no evidence that they weren't capable of it either. Tool use would have started much earlier than 2.5 million years ago, though. Archaeologists recovered bones with cut marks on them from Dakika in Ethiopia, dated to a whopping 3.4 million years ago. The most likely hominin behind this was Australopithecus afarensis. Such early tool use does not mean hominins were producing modified stone tools, they may have just been using sharp stones they found on the ground. As we believe that the Paranthropus genus evolved from the Australopithecus genus, then there's no reason to think that they couldn't have used tools in a similar way. For Robustus in South Africa, there's ever so slightly more convincing evidence of tool use. A hand tentatively assigned to Paranthropus robustus shows that they would have been capable of a precision grip just like us. It's also possible that bone tools assigned to robustus were potentially used to dig through termite mounds. All in all, the evidence for Paranthropus producing and using stone and bone tools is not overwhelming, but also not impossible. Herpes is one of the world's oldest viruses. It's been around for hundreds of millions of years. Chickens have it, chimps have it, I have it, you have it, everyone has it. Typically, herpes evolves along with its host and each host has its own particular form of the virus. Uniquely amongst primates though, humans have two forms, herpes simplex 1 and herpes simplex 2. That's the one you get downstairs. Genetic tests carried out on the viruses show that herpes simplex 1 is our own little brand of herpes, been with us forever and has evolved through the ages with us for yonks and yonks. Herpes simplex 2, however, is a much closer relative to chimpanzee herpes, so how the hell did we catch that? Genetic tests have shown that the split between simplex 2 and chimpanzee herpes occurred around 1.6 million years ago and was passed on to one of our unlucky ancestors through an unknown intermediary. Using estimates of geographical overlap between hominins of 1.6 million years ago and the ancestors of chimpanzees, the most likely candidate for transferring genital herpes was our boy, Paranthropus boise, who somehow caught it from ancient chimps and transferred it to Homo erectus. We don't know how this transfer occurred. They could have been fighting with each other, or eating meat with little herpes boils on, gross, or having sex. It can't be ruled out that a one and a half million year old love triangle gave us this humiliating disease. Fascinatingly, this isn't the first STI to jump species like that. 3.3 million years ago, our ancestors caught pubic lice from the ancestors of gorillas. Don't ask me how. So the next time your nether regions are covered in bugs and boils, just do what I do. Relax, try not to worry, take comfort in the fact that it's a beautiful, if itchy, reminder of the wonders of evolution. After around 1.5 million years, the Paranthropus genus came to an end and, well, basically we don't know why. It was believed that because they were dietary specialists that they couldn't adapt to changing climates very easily. Well, that may explain the decline of the grass-loving Boise, 
but Robustus had a varied diet, so it doesn't really explain their disappearance. Also, many other animals survive on a diet of grass to this day. It is certainly not an unviable niche to fill. Perhaps they were outcompeted by the up and coming Homo genus. They started to disappear around the same time as the appearance of Homo ergaster and Homo erectus. Perhaps they were hunted to extinction. Perhaps they were outbred as more intelligent hominins spread across the landscape. Possible, but again, Paranthropus did not share the same diet as Homo. So what would they have been competing over? Access to shelter, perhaps? As I said, we really don't know. Hey, skiddly doo, I'm Stefan. Thanks for watching my video. Be sure to check out the other chaps' videos on different elements of uh, our evolutionary tree. They're fantastic, I promise you. And don't trust anything I say, you know, I'm just a human. Could have interpreted the evidence wrong. That's why I'm always very careful to post my sources in the description. So why, on a video about our evolution, did I pick a distant cousin whose only contribution is genital herpes? Well. I actually really bloody love these guys. When I went to university to study archaeology, I for sure thought I was going to spend my time studying the Romans and medieval castles and all of that stuff. And don't get me wrong, I still love all of that. But in the first year, you have to study a bit of everything. And just learning about these guys just blew my mind. I had no concept that there were upright walking hominins who were so different to us, who would have looked so different to us with this sagittal crest, who ate a diet that was so different to ours, and it just really has stayed with me this whole time. I, I love these Paranthropus chaps, so it's always a good reminder for me to keep an open mind, you know? You don't know what you don't know, so. Anyway, I've waffled on long enough. Thanks for watching. As always, if you're into prehistory, the Stone Age human evolution, consider subscribing. See ya.